Uh, before we get started, is there anyone here from China? China? Anyone? Anyone speak Chinese? I know there's a lot of you, but you may not right understand uh, the way I'm, ask I'm asking it. The reason I'm asking is because we, uh, Seth and I wrote a book on Windows.net server security, and a translator from China just wrote to us and said that he's translated it to Chinese. Uh, and it's a pirated copy. So we, we encouraged him uh, to, uh, we, put it, we said we put a link up. Uh, for anyone that wants it, we'll forward you to him. Uh, and you can get a copy of this book in Chinese. Uh, some of you, <laughs> well, and if you want a free copy, get the Chinese version, because you don't have to pay for it. It's, it's <laughs> Uh, and also, this book is uh, for sale at Loom Panics. We're going to be out there. Uh, if you want us to sign your copy, uh, you can read it and then sell it on eBay for a small profit right after that. So uh, you won't lose any money. Hey, by the way, by the way, the goon staff just told me that uh, I have to give the software, this hardware away up here. So. We're going to ask a couple questions of you guys when we're done, and whoever gets it right will get this ancient, decrepit equipment. We have no idea. He just said we're giving it away, but you're welcome to. It's doubtful that it will run .NET Server, though, because that's it. .NET Server takes a very high uh, footprint. Um, and uh, for just some bookkeeping items, if we could get the next slide, please. I'm Cyrus Bakari, and this is Seth Fogey. And uh, for those of you uh, that want, the slides are available online, and they're also on the conference CD. So you guys should not have to take any notes at all. You can just relax and enjoy. And there's also a paper that goes along with this talk because we don't have enough time to go into everything. So we went into more detail on the paper, and that's also available on your conference CD. So we encourage you guys to skim through that, or you can download it online, and we'll give you uh, the URL again at the end. And we're also going to leave, leave time for questions. We'll probably talk about 40, 45 minutes. And we're not going to be at the Dallas Con table uh, because uh, our table was, last time we checked, piled high with uh, refuse. So <laughs> it's not very usable. But we're going to be at the Loom Panics table afterwards. Next slide. Uh, well, what is .NET Server? Uh, well, first of all, how many people here use Linux? Raise your hand. Everybody? OK. So um, you're, you're here to find exploits, probably. Is it, who here uses? <laughs> who you, exactly. Evangelize open source. Who uses NT? OK. Who uses Windows 2000? A lot of people. Is there anyone using .NET Server yet? A few people. Uh, well, then let me ask, does anyone here work for Microsoft? A couple. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> That's not a smart thing to do here. Uh, the, well, .NET Server is the next version of Windows 2000. It has been, uh, it's, a, it's the enterprise operating system uh, that's going to go head to head against Linux. Um, before you laugh, we're going to go into some more uh, about the architecture. But it's, it's basically Windows 2002 or 2003, if you want to think of it that way. It's been re-engineered from the Windows 2000 code base. And it's actually been delayed several times. And this is significant for our purposes uh, because it's been, it's, the latest uh, word is that it's been going to be expected out mid-2003, although Microsoft recently retracted that in the last few days. And they said that it's probably going to be out at the end of uh, this year or early 2003. And in fact, the release candidate, one, is going to be out in a couple of weeks, from what we've heard. It's out now. OK, I better go get it. Uh, the, and Microsoft, most recently, the delays they've been, uh, they've been saying is for security reasons. And it, it almost seems like Microsoft's become a little uh, uh, skittish because of all the uh, exploits that have been found in their software. They keep pushing it back and pushing it back. And this is, uh, ultimately, it's going to reach a point where if it's in beta any longer, it's going to be obsolete before it's released. 
Next slide, please. We're going to talk, just hit a very few of the points of uh, .NET, not .NET Server security. We're going to talk about some of the architecture and some of the policies surrounding .NET Server, which we think are going to hurt Microsoft's uh, perception of security even worse than it already is. We're going to talk about Windows product activation, uh, Kerberos implementation, remote desktop and remote assistance vulnerabilities, and uh, wireless support, and again, the policies. Next slide. Well, WPA is Windows product activation, and it is the default uh, anti-piracy scheme of .NET Server. And this was actually first introduced in XP. And because of public outcry, Microsoft has been somewhat backing off from it, but it looks like they are going to ship it with .NET Server. Uh, Maybe they'll change their mind after our talk, but we doubt that. Uh, and there, uh, can anyone think, of, does anyone, uh, well, first of all, let me explain what it is. Uh, uh, WPA, uh, well, let's get into that later. But there are some serious privacy concerns with WPA, and a lot of these center around the BSA or Business Software Alliance. And who knows what the BSA is? That's good. I hope a lot of you will know afterwards, after this talk, what it is and we'll investigate it more. Uh, the BSA is the uh, kind of the hired anti-piracy enforcers of Microsoft. And also, they work for other large organizations such as Adobe and Symantec. And what they do is they hunt down businesses that use pirated software and pressure them into paying a fine uh, using various means. They're similar to the Canadian Alliance Against Software Theft, or CAST. Uh, next slide. Well, the way Windows Product Activation, or WPA, works is that when you install the operating system on your machine, it takes a hash based on the specifications of your unique machine. So it's a fingerprint for your individual box. And based on that, uh, you obtain from Microsoft a activation key that will only let it work on that operating system. Otherwise, the OS will expire in two weeks. It'll lock and you won't be able to use it. It's been said that WPA phones home at intervals in the final release, but we haven't seen that yet, so we're not going to, we don't know for sure, but we'll, we'll have to watch it. But one problem with this is if you change out enough hardware, the operating system again will lock, and this could be your production server uh, or your backup server. And all of a sudden, you've got a locked operating system and you're stuck. You have to go through Microsoft, which if you read in the paper that's on your conference CD or online, uh, we, we describe one uh, administrator's nightmare when he tried to get WPA activated on his system. Can, can anyone think of any other software that uses something like WPA? Does anyone? Windows Media. Citrix, Windows Media. It takes a hash of your... AutoCAD? AutoCAD, I don't know. XP, XP definitely. That's where it's introduced. I, pardon? Uh, I don't know that one either. Ooh. So, so apparently Quark uh, t takes a hash and requires a hardware dongle, which is basically a hardware almost like a key, except it's, 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 a anti it's a protection algorithm that's hardware you have to buy, and it's usually very expensive for that. Um, I believe that EI products actually do this also, although I've been too polite to reverse engineer them because they're our partners. So, but if anyone looks into that, let me know. Uh, next. Uh, some of the abuses of the Business Software Alliance, and we've been talking about this for a couple of years now, but it's, most people don't know about the BSA. Uh, the BSA are anti-piracy hired enforcers. They're supported financially by Microsoft to go chase you down. And there's been complaints of heavy-handed tactics that they use. And there, I talk about these in the paper some more, but for one thing, they'll uh, hit your city with a radio cam campaign, uh, trying, to get all, trying to get your employees to uh, report you for using unlicensed software. Based on that, they can get a warrant and raid you. And they do it all the time. 
uh, or any kind of anonymous tip is enough for them to get a warrant. And uh, they, there's actually, in, the, in Great Britain, it's been reported that they'll approach the company and say, we put you on a list of violators or, or pirates on our website. If you want to get taken off, then you have to run our special software, which scans your network drives for any licenses that have expired. And now, a lot of you laugh at this, but companies actually do this. They're so scared by the whole BSA spectacle uh, that they they voluntarily submit and end up paying hundreds of thousands of dollars just so they don't get exposed or raided by the BSA. And in fact, the, the acronym BSA sounds like a federal agency. It's a three-letter acronym. And they, you know, they show up in your office with suits and uh, usually a police officer and a warrant, and you think it's a government agency. But the truth is you can just turn these guys away or, unless they've gotten to the step of getting a warrant. Uh, but most of the time, the companies will just roll over and say, okay, come in, audit us, give us a fine, we'll be happy to pay it, just don't report us, which is, which is really silly, but it happens all the time. And in fact, the BSA themselves report that they've collected $75 million in this way so far. Now, if this kind of thing concerns you, uh, the only site that I've seen that really gets into this uh, that I've seen is stay-legal.org. You should check it out. There used to be an anti-bsa.org, but I haven't seen that up for a while now. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, Kerberos, and this was actually drawn by a friend of mine for our book. And this is the three-headed dog that, got, that guards the entrance to Hades. Uh, it's also Cerberus in uh, later mythology. And Kerberos was designed at MIT uh, in the 1980s under the project Athena. Now this is a review for most of you, but for those that don't know Kerberos, I'm going to do a brief review. The project Athena tried to implement all three heads, which were uh, authentication, authorization, and auditing. And in fact, later implementations, including Microsoft's, eventually got all three heads working. And it's been thought up until recently that Kerberos was pretty unbreakable. Uh, next slide. And just to review the Kerberos authentication, if I can, I don't remember it myself. So, uh, If you're a client down at the bottom and you want to access a network resource, such as a server, uh, you can't just go directly. First, you have to go through a key distribution center, or KDC, which is up in the left upper left corner. And the client uh, first has to request from the KDC a ticket granting ticket. And, and all domain controllers uh, by default are KDCs. The KDC responds with a ticket granting service ticket. Uh, and uh, uh, when, the, when the client presents his TGT back, and based upon that uh, ticket granting service, the client can finally access the server up in the right, upper right. And if mutual authentication is specified, the client can ask the server also to authenticate back to it. Next slide. Well, many of you have seen this. This is uh, Frank O'Dwyer showed that it's, there's a potential attack against Kerberos. And, and, and this doesn't work if you've uh, used PKI or smart cards. But in our uh, paper, we, we, just, we review some of the well-known attacks that have already been described against PKI and how to reverse engineer smart cards uh, using hardware reverse engineering also. So I encourage you to look at that. Uh, but this method is to use, uh, first you have to sniff a login session and capture that. Now in Kerberos authentication, you use an encrypted timestamp and a crypt cryptographic checksum uh, using a key derived from the user's password. Next slide. Now the timestamp that's used in that pre-authentication step, that first step one and two, which we showed between the client and the KDC, uh, the timestamp is ASCII encoded prior to encryption. And it looks like this. If the timestamp looks like uh, year, month, day, hour, minutes, and seconds. And the RC4 key we know is derived from the user's password. Now that timestamp is important for brute force cracking because uh, O'Dwyer talks about how to uh, theoretically build a point and click device 
a password cracker that will uh, work on this. Next slide. So, so how do you know with a brute force password cracker if you've got the right password? Well, the, with because of this uh, ASCII, ASCII encoding, you can just decrypt, and if you see a string that looks like a timestamp, you're pretty sure that you've got the right password. So you don't have to go through the additional step each time of computing the processor expensive embedded cryptographic checksum to make sure you got it. Because if you get it something that looks like a timestamp, then you're almost certainly right. Next slide. Uh, now, Seth is going to talk a little bit about uh, remote assistance. Uh, has anyone used remote assistance yet? Yes? No, not too many. Before I do this, uh, I want to give away one of these things. And I'm going to ask this question again. And whoever acknowledges their answer the loudest will get this Sun Spark Station 10. Um, who works for Microsoft? Bill Gates! No, no. Who of you works for my good? All right, you got it. <laughs> BSA. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I got another. I don't know what this is. It's just a computer with no CPU. It doesn't even have a CD-ROM. It has a floppy. Uh, so I'll ask you all, and who, again, acknowledges the loudest or most uh, distinctly, we'll get this. Who here has pirated software? <laughs> all right, you got it. <laughs> Come on up. Whoever that was. <laughs> Yeah, in a dumpster maybe. <laughs> Are you a Fed? <laughs> and I have one final thing here. It's a Meritech Technician Handbook. Um, who here works for Meritech? Right here. All right, <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> I hope you didn't fly. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I'm going to talk about a couple things. The first is going to be remote assistance. Uh, if you haven't, <laughs> how much did you give him to take that? <laughs> All right. Who? You, you, many of you have heard of it, and some of you have used it. And if you haven't, remote assistance simply provides a way for novice users to get help from their technical gurus that work at their location, or their friends, or their fathers, or their sons, or whoever. Um, it allows us assistance through voice, chat, uh, video at times. It is only works with Windows XP and .NET. Um, there's several security issues around remote assistance that I've found that aren't even that technical, but they're just kind of like, I don't know, oversights. Uh, the beta3.NET server relays its remote assistance request through Microsoft's website. Now, I haven't had a chance to get into the RC1, but if you've used the XP version, which I'm sure those of you who have used remote assistance have probably used it there, it sends it direct to without Microsoft's intervention. Uh, this, to me, seems like a serious privacy issue, and I'm not sure why they did that. Uh, firewalls is why they did that? It's a reflector. OK. Does Microsoft collect any information? Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would never write. The BSA collects that. Uh, the password is optional, which to me also is another issue because if anything, people take the path of least resistance, just like many of the physical properties of our universe. Uh, the cry for help can be heard by all, and we'll get into this. And there's also a potential 180 degree attack method that can be used as I thought about it when I was sitting in the DC phone home talk that remote assistance can also be used that way. This is how remote assistance works. You send a, you open up your help screen, you click on the link at the top, and it opens up a remote assistance screen. Um, from here, you can either send a request through email, through uh, a chat, or through just a file. In the XP version, it's, it creates an XML file, which is all right, but I mean that still has some problems. But in this version, when you uh, send it, we'll get into that. But right here's where the password entry is. You can simply just de-check that. And 
you all are pretty familiar, I hope, with you know security issues. But if you are in charge of a company's uh, computer department, you'll know that people hate passwords, and names they do use passwords are lousy. Uh, all you have to do is uncheck that box. If you do uncheck that box, and then you send the email to the other person, I'm using email in this case, and if someone happened to be running a sniffer on a network, they would easily be able to capture this. And you can't see this too clearly, but it is in our slides. The highlighted portion there is a hyperlink, which is the link that goes to Microsoft. With a little massaging, anybody can take that hyperlink, plug it into their browser, and pull up the same remote assistance connection screen. From there, you just simply click the button. I mean, script kiddies can handle this one. <laughs> so now you're getting the, the Microsoft.net connection screen. And up comes a little box. Hey, this person's coming to ask for help. And I mean, coming to help you. Are you going to let them help you? Well, if you're a Joe Schmo user, you're probably going to because you sent the request in the first place. And now anybody can have whatever fun they want. They can, bug, I mean, you name it, they could do it. Uh, yeah, I'm Joe Schmo help. I'm you know, your tech guy. Let me uh, format your hard drive for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You can, uh, this, uh, what this basically says, well, I mean, what do you do now? You social engineer to the point of wherever you want to go. You install backdoor, Trojan, virus, or, you know, just have some fun with the person. Call them names. Um, again, this problem, as I see it, is threefold. The password is not required, and I, I understand, you know, helping the user out, making this world a little more user-friendly, but... That doesn't seem like security uh, conscious behavior there. Uh, again, it's an insecure method of transferring it. It didn't take me long to figure this out. Uh, anybody could grab that off the wire. And maybe this isn't going to exist in the final version. Maybe they'll switch back to the XML, or maybe they'll do some more uh, further encryption or something like that. But at this point, that's what I have to go with. Um, and again, Microsoft is in there for the firewall relay. but. I don't know many people that are too uh, excited about having Microsoft further putting their foot in our lives. We want to ask for a password because the password is not passed at all. Well, sorry. When the password field is filled out, at what point will the attacker be nullified? And the password is not sent at all. They have to call. They have to send it. Well, if you send an email, well, then you know you send the password in plain text anyway. So that kind of defeats that. Unless you're using PGP, but if you're using PGP, you're probably not asking for help. Um, <laughs> so, again, the problem is threefold. Uh, what can we do about this? Security policies, as unuseful as they are and as everyone ignores them, I mean, it's a place to start. It covers your rear end. Uh, end user training, if you do have people that like to use this feature, make sure that they, they call you at least or, or do something to get you a password and that they do use a password. Or you could just, you know, stick the VNC, PC anywhere, or back workers for all that. Now, remote desktop, and I will say remote desktop, I do like it, I use it. It's a very friendly piece of software. It just kind of concerns me because um, it allows a person full control of your computer. It's something worth bringing up, but not something worth getting all excited about, so I'm just gonna bring up on this slide. Um, the purpose is basically, how many of you used remote desktop before? So, I don't know, 30% maybe have used it. For those of you who don't know, it's just like PC Anywhere. It allows somebody remotely to get into your computer and to take it over. You have full control over it. It basically, it's an invisible interface remotely to, to operate a computer just like you were sitting there. Um, again, it's, it's basically a legitimate Trojan, except that it works pretty good. Um, security issues. Because it runs on a dedicated port, anybody can port scan for it, and you can easily detect that it's there. Once you detect that it's there, then you can move to the next step and you can try and brute force it. Because most people who uh, own computers like to put strong passwords in, it might be a difficult thing. Not. So, you know, put one, two, three, four, put admin in there, put password. Eventually, you're going to get a, what to take to write a script to scan a bunch of computers and, and uh, test for this. Uh, this does allow full access to the computer. Again, you're sitting right in front of it from a virtual location. So unless the original user notices you logging in, which kicks them out, if it's at night, I mean, there's nothing stopping them from getting access to anything else that computer's connected to. Uh, it is disabled by default. 
which is good and that's smart. Uh, but when you enable it, it typically enables itself on the administrator account if you're using an administrator account, which most people do. Uh, now, one thing that is worth mentioning is that IPACs, you can get software to connect it with your IPACs. So somebody could just walk into your network and you know sit there with their IPAC on your, in your wireless network. You would think they're updating their tasks and they're taking over your computer. Um, another thing, TS Web, which is a, it's an ActiveX scripting. Uh, it downloads an applet to your computer and you run it there and it allows any computer without having a remote desktop client software installed to be able to connect up to another, to be able to connect up to the, uh, the, the actual host remote desktop computer. It's a very nice thing to have if you are on a, uh, like in the library or something and you want to connect to your home, but it's also a, a possible insecurity. Um, again, my desktop is an excellent tool. I, I do say that because I do appreciate it. It is arguably free because it comes with the OS. Um, and there have been relatively few posts about uh, vulnerabilities to it. Most of those are not on service. The next thing I want to talk about is wireless networking. Um, dot. Show on time. Oh. Okay, wireless networking. .NET supports wireless networking. Uh, it comes with the support for web and it comes with uh, support for 802.11x. Um, .NET wireless security issues. Um, if you haven't, I mean, if you use uh, .NET, you, to get connected to DEF CON land, what do you have to do? Plug in your card. It automatically found it, it automatically connected to it, and automatically made your computer part of the network. And then you probably got scanned by 50 other hackers out there that are trying to find your open ports. Um, so it's kind of questionable to me why you want to put, I understand the point and I understand how all that works, but to put a such a susceptible technology in a server device seems to me that it's it's a little scary to do because uh, a war driving well we all know what that is and for those of you that aren't here you're probably at war driving on the contest right now and you aren't here to even acknowledge that uh, web is crackable and we know that but I want to talk about web for a minute because I note that a lot of people, although they know what web is, they know it's crackable and they know that the tools exist and maybe even know how to use the tools um, they don't really know what web, how web is crackable. And because we're talking about a server here, I just want to talk about it twofold. One, to let you know about web and that people are interested in it, and the other that, uh, I forget the other. But there's another. Okay, next one. And so web. Web is the wired equivalency privacy protocol or scheme. It defines security and the transmission of data. Um, it, Encryption is based on a 5 or 13 character password. It uses the RC4 algorithm, which is a, a fairly common encryption used. It is uh, weakened by initialization vector collisions, and we'll get into this, and um, weak initialization vector. It is crackable in two hours in best of conditions, and that is not usually the case. It's typically a lot longer, and it can take several weeks on like a home user network where they're only like sending email across it. Uh, RC4, again, it's an encryption type. It uses a symmetric key, which means it has one key, not like a public-private key like a PGP. Um, it uses a streaming key, which means it has a different key for each packet of information, so you have like a different password for each packet, which is a pretty strong method of encrypting on a surface. Uh, so each packet is protected with a unique password. This is a general overview. I'm not going to go into it. You can look into the paper. Uh, initialization vector is one of the most important parts of understanding why RC, uh, why a web is crackable. Uh, its purpose is to create, again, a unique key. And it does this by combining a packet with an initialization vector value, which is three characters. And I kind of illustrate this here, where if packet one had ABC games, packet two would have DEF games, and so on. So web's key is 24-bit or three characters. Um, RC4, this is a general, where my little pin go? This is a general way it works. You have the initialization vector value right here combined with the password to create your secret key is fed into the key scheduling algorithm which is then creates a streaming key using a state array value for those who are familiar with arrays it then uh, is merged with the data through an XOR uh, calculation and out comes the ciphertext and this is the first part the key scheduling algorithm it is responsible for creating a random array this array is 
with the current version of WEP is 0 through 255, with, and it scrambles the numbers. And so you can have any sequential from like 2555, or 255, the next one could be 13, next one could be 12, the next one could be 68. It creates it randomly to be used in the creation of the, of the streaming key. And it uses the initialization vector plus the password to do this. The PRGA creates a streaming cipher key, and that again is explored with the the plain text to create the cipher text. And it performs additional swapping, which is the swapping is how you end up with the um, pseudorandom state array. And this is the basic overall encryption scheme. We showed this before, where the, things are, where the, I, the IV and a password are merged, and it passes on down to the encrypted text. This is the decryption, the initialization vector, and this is the, the biggest weakness, is that it is sent in plain text with the cipher text. So any hacker or anybody really with a sniffer can easily grab that first three characters of the packet when they already know the initialization vector. So they have this, it's uh, on the decryption side. This is merged with the password, which is shared previously between the user and the client, uh, the client and the host. And it gets fed back through here, back, uh, back through the KSA, back through the PRGA to recreate the um, original data by exploring it with the ciphertext. And then it goes through a CRC calculation. And if it's good, the data is accepted. Now the weaknesses summarizes. If you know any two XOR values, the third can be deduced. It's just basically a simple comparison. You understand what I mean if you know XOR. It's explained further in the paper. Um, I, the first iteration of I, and I is just a variable that holds a value, will hold, um, well, let's see, it's always equal to one for the first iteration of the PRGA. And the PRGA is just a continuous loop that loops through until there's no more data. It, again, merges this, the streaming key with the, um, it creates a streaming key and it merges that with the, the, the plain text to create the ciphertext. The first byte of the plain text file is always a snap header. And there are other ways that you can do this that increases the chances of, of cracking it faster. Um, but at, at, using most tools that are out there, there's a 5% probability that this, the, the state array values between 0 and 3 will stay the same after the first four iterations of the KSA. And again, this is explained in that paper. The link, although you can't see it probably, is up there to the paper and that will be at the end of the, this slideshow. Uh, really quickly, these are the things that are important to know. They are assumed values. N is an index value. It just keeps track of how many times it goes through a loop, basically. Um, this these values right here indicate a weak um, key. This is the byte of the password that you're cracking. This indicates the weak key, and this could be any value. And when you're collecting data, tools such as uh, WebCrack or whatever, they collect all the data as much as they can find, and then they start doing a statistical analysis on the data that's collected. And the one that comes up the most common is probably going to be your key. So it just collects the byte, so then we'll collect uh, 1 through 255 on this. Um, the secret key, again, is a combination of, uh, here's your key. This is the key that we use in the example. This is an initialization vector again. The secret key is the combination of those two. Uh, you'll see a modulus if you start studying the code. Uh, it's a modulus operator. If you're familiar with programming or, or you like mathematics, you'll understand what I mean by that. Um, and again, you assume that the state array value swaps swap in as a 5% chance. When you're working with it, this is what this is what I came up with to make things easier to keep track because you start getting a lot of values going on. This is my key array that if I was testing it, or if a program was testing it, if you want to do it on paper, if I was testing it, I would have this set up. And then I list my original state array values with my uh, original i and j values. This is the equation that's used to create this value, which is used in here to swap values right here. And again, I'm going to cover this real fast in the next couple of slides because we're running out of time. It's in the paper. Please read it. When you come to loop two, you go through the same equation process and the same swap. Loop three, same thing. And now the important thing to note is that because none of these values have been used at this point, it's all been key zero, which is used right here, the key value. Key zero, key one, and key two are the only ones that have been used in here, which can be, again, sniffed off the wireless network. So anybody can do this. Anybody can recreate the first three, the first three loops. And when you recombine, when you merge that, I mean, combine that with knowing that the first three loops don't, the state array values in the first three that are written oh, wrong. When you combine that with the fact that the state array values created by the um, KSA don't change five percent of the time, 
you have a pretty big hole which we can work with to find the key. And this would be KSA loop 4 if we do know, did know the key. Um, now if we're looking at it from a hacker's point of view, this is what it would look like. We don't know these, this part of the, the key. But we do know that XOR has a kind of a weakness in which we can recreate the first byte of a PRGA. And you do this by combining our uh, snap header, which we know exists, with the first byte of ciphertext to create a value. In this case, it was 15. Now, we can work our way back through the PRGA, and we end, we end up with the S of 3 value being equal to 15 at the KSA loop 3, or iteration 3. And it, now it's just a matter of going backwards and plugging it in and doing some simple calculations, and we can recreate that value right here. So now we know the first byte of our key. And you just basically continue this through the whole process. Now again, this particular example is one that works. It is going to re recreate it. I didn't want to take a chance because there's only a 5% probability that I would get it right, so I found one that worked. Um, again, this is just overview of wireless networking. Windows.net supports it. WEP is crackable, so you have a possible presentation point if you use WEP and only rely on WEP for your uh, security and your wireless network. So what to do, there's many other things you can bind with uh, WEP to make it secure. And even WEP itself, it is a fallback point in which you can be uh, claiming that you're not liable against people who hack. You, if someone actually breaks WEP, you know they were trying to get into your network. Um, the only other option is don't use wireless networks. Next year, at this point, they're going to release a version that should take care of this problem and basically seal up that hole. Again, the slides are available there. And I think we're back on you. Now that, now that we have your attention, uh, Seth has written more about that actually in a book, which will be coming out later this year, on wireless security. Uh, and he talks about uh, the default XP uh, use of that and how it can get you into some bad legal troubles. Uh, I want to talk about uh, some of Microsoft's policies and uh, many of you, or some of you, Probably not many of you. Some of you uh, have in the past partnered with Microsoft for security. They used to have a Microsoft Security Partners Program, or MSPP, where they would let smaller security consulting groups, like many of you all, partner with them. And they would send you business, and uh, you, know, you would help them find vulnerabilities and things like that. Well, Microsoft terminated this last November without any warning. And they rolled it into their Microsoft Gold Certified Partner for Security Solutions, or CPSS. The problems with this is it kind of shut out the smaller guy, the, the smaller security consulting group, uh, which is a shame because a lot of the best vulnerabilities are found by the small independent security groups. Next slide. And now if you want to be a Microsoft security partner, you have to have at least four MCSEs on your, in your company, which uh, very few smaller guys do. You also have to pay Microsoft now to be a member. In the United States, it's currently $1,450 a year, uh, which puts it out of the range of uh, some, more, some small independents. You also have to inform Microsoft about specific security customer details, including what you're working on and who you're doing it for, uh, which in our industry, a lot, a lot of people don't want, uh, if you're consulting for someone doing penetration testing, they don't want you to be telling other people that you're doing it. Uh, and now you have to sign a full disclosure, what I call a gag rule. I don't think Microsoft calls it that, but it, <laughs> But it basically says that if you want to work with us, you can't disclose your vulnerabilities publicly uh, unless you follow our protocol. And that puts it out of the range of a lot of people. And I want to talk a little bit more about this gag rule. Next slide. Uh, well, the, the gag rule, uh, as uh, we talked about, last November, Microsoft formed a coalition with five security companies. And these were Bindview, Foundstone, Gardent, At Stake, and ISS. Does anyone here work for those? I'm sure there's several, but you're not raising your hand. Uh, I actually, not to bash them, I actually have very good friends that work for a lot of uh, these companies, and they're really smart guys. Uh, but one thing that they had to do to, to get into this coalition is they had to agree to spare Microsoft from 
public embarrassment with vulnerability disclosures. So they had to sign a gag rule to be a member. And next slide. Now what's, what's the problem with this? Why is such a policy bad for Microsoft? And why, why do we think that it, it can raise some, uh, some negative security issues or press for Microsoft? Well, uh, here, here's one example. A lot of you heard about uh, uh, ISS releasing a severe Apache vulnerability to bug track. Uh, last month, actually in June. How many people know about that? Everybody. Okay, that was all over the media. And the uh, problem with this, and for those of you that do run Apache on Windows, does anyone do that? Am I the only one in the world who does that? <laughs> it's actually pretty good. Uh, if you have to use uh, Windows in your environment, uh, Apache is a lot, uh, it's a good alternative to IIS, as a lot of other people have pointed out. Uh, the problem is that there's many distributions of Apache, especially on Windows, it's a binary install, and it wasn't working. And ISS only gave one day, or less than a day, notice before they posted this vulnerability publicly. And for those of us that stayed up past midnight trying to get this patch to work uh, and didn't get any sleep that, that night, we're not going to forget it anytime soon. Uh, so there's no grace period. And uh, what's the problem? How can... How can we possibly blame Microsoft for what, for ISS's faux pas? How, how is that possible? Well, we can't directly blame them, but uh, if we get the next slide, or actually back, back one slide, uh, down at the bottom, uh, the problem with this is ISS signed, a, signed this gag rule to be a partner of Microsoft. They said, we're going to spare you vulnerabilities for 30 days. At the same time, ISS turns around and attacks one of Microsoft's biggest competitors. In fact, their biggest competitor in the server market, and that's Apache, with no grace period. So here they're favoring Microsoft with a gag rule on one hand, turning around and hitting their competitor, violating that same gag rule uh, on the other hand. Is that illegal? No. But it does potentially raise some ethical concerns. And uh, the question is, was there any pressure from Microsoft for them to do this, to exert anti-competitive pressure? Now, I'm certain the answer is no. There was no intentional anti-competitive pressure. But the fact that there is a relationship between ISS and Microsoft raises that issue of conflict of interest. Because ISS is presumably gaining benefit from being a partner, such as free publicity or leads from Microsoft. They are benefiting from Microsoft. So to turn around and attack an open source competitor uh, does raise some issues. So this is going to hurt Microsoft more than anything indirectly. If they have a gag rule, which they probably shouldn't, that's very controversial to begin with. But if they do, they should ask their partners to make it apply equally to their open source competitors to avoid raising such an issue. Next slide. Well, in this talk, we've discussed uh, some potential attacks against the architecture. I have to say that we haven't found any severe vulnerabilities in the implementation itself. And so overall, for those of you that did admit to working for Microsoft, you can pat yourselves on the back. There, believe me, though, there will be exploits and lots of them, but that's okay. They can be fixed. What you don't want to do if you're Microsoft is try to is try to patch things by enforcing gag rules and other policies like that. If you have a vulnerability, the best thing probably is just to admit your mistake and give credit to the person who found it, then fix it and go on. The public is going to respect you a lot more in the long run than if you try to influence industry standards by creating RFCs against full disclosure, which has happened. Uh, so I think more than the architecture, I think Microsoft policies should be overhauled. Next slide. So our humble recommendations to Microsoft, not that they will pay any attention, but here is, these are some suggestions for improvement. Uh, go ahead and move to uh, final release of the operating system, because if you keep being scared to release it, it's going to be obsolete. It will already have been in beta for two years almost. And it actually makes, your, makes, it makes you stronger to be tested. It's, it's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, number two, we would recommend immediately and totally removing the WPA. 
because if you're Microsoft, all of your hard work making this operating system is going to be flushed down the toilet because no self-respecting administrator is going to put up with this. If you read about uh, what we talked about, uh, if you read that comment in the uh, paper that comes with this talk, you're going to see what I'm talking about. It's extremely humiliating, the whole WPA concept. Uh, and finally, we would, uh, again, get, change the gag rule and finally uh, terminate association with the BSA or Business Software Alliance. The truth is that uh, your people who pirate your Microsoft software, if they do it commercially and it's a large pirating ring, that's, that's something different. But to go after the honest companies or the honest small system administrator who's just doing his best job and may have one license somewhere expired and, and using heavy-handed tactics against this such companies, that's only going to hurt you in the long run. And I think Microsoft's been lucky so far because people don't really know about the BSA too much yet. But if there's one message we want you to take home after this talk is to read more about the BSA and to make your own informed decision. Next slide. Uh, again, we'll be available uh, to take questions for just a few minutes and then we'll be at the Loom Panics table. Uh, if anyone wants to get their uh, copy of our book signed so that they can sell it on eBay for a profit. And here are the links. Thank you very much.